Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Thea Papalizio, member of the Darwin Festival Committee. Uh, and before I start, I just want to uh, turn it over to Dr. Fisher, who has some uh, prizes to announce. Okay, so uh, before I introduce our speaker this morning, I just have a few announcements to make. Firstly, I'd like to welcome everyone here in Vets Hall, as well as our online audience to the 44th annual Darwin Festival here at Salem State University. We have about 200 people joining us also via webinar this morning. For those attendees, please be aware that closed captioning is available by clicking the show captions button at the bottom of your screen. There will be time for questions at the end of the talk. You can type in your questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. Then a moderator will share these with Dr. Distel during the in-person questions. We apologize in advance if your question's not asked due to limited time. If you get bumped out of the webinar, you can quit Zoom and then re-enter the webinar using the link in the webinar services email you received following your registration. Finally, if you're joining us online via your registration link and are seeking credit for a course, your attendance is automatically logged. For my friends here in Vets Hall, we will project a QR code prior to the QA session over on that wall. And you may use that, you hopefully have a, a phone that you can use um, to record your attendance for this talk. I would also like to thank the chemistry and physics department and the Charles Albert Reed Trust for sponsoring this morning's talk. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dan Distel. Dr. Distel completed a bachelor's degree in biology at Rutgers University and a PhD in marine biology at Scripps Institute, Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. He's presently a professor of marine science at Northeastern University. He's also the founding director and CEO of Ocean Genome Legacy, a nonprofit organization housed at Northeastern's Marine Science Center in the Hunt. It serves as a research laboratory, biodiversity archive, and the nation's first public access marine genome bank with the ultimate mission of protecting and preserving marine species. The OGL collection currently contains 29,323 DNA samples from over 1,000 marine families. Broadly, Dr. Distel's research involves the evolution, physiological ecology, genomics, and metabolism of marine bacteria and bacteria-animal symbioses. Today, he will share with us the discovery of an ancient forest buried from millennia under the sea that now hosts a thriving and unique community of marine life. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Distel to Salem State and to our annual Darwin Festival. Okay, that worked, great. Um, all right, well, um, thank you for that nice introduction. Oh, I don't think I've turned on my microphone just a minute. Yeah, there we go. Is that better? Great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again for that nice introduction. Uh, Dan, I'm Dan Distel. I'm the director of the Ocean Genome Legacy Center at Northeastern University. And the title of my talk today is here, Life in an Ancient Undersea Forest, The Secrets of a Marine Ecosystem Powered by Wood. Um, but before I get started, and so I don't forget, I want to um, acknowledge a number of the people who were involved in this project. Uh, so when I say we did this or we did that, it really means they did this. Um, so uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Marvin Altamia, who did the lion's share of the experimental work that I'll uh, described today. Uh, Rosie Poulin and professors Mark Patterson and Brian Helmuth, uh, who are not only our colleagues, research colleagues at Northeastern, but also part of our intrepid dive team. Uh, uh, Hannah Pia Madsen, who runs our collections and our databases at Ocean Genome Legacy, and basically keeps me from losing data and losing my mind. Um, I also want to thank Grant Lockridge, who is the fantastic uh, dive master at Dauphin Island Sea Labs, where we did much of this work. Uh, Grant somehow managed to keep us all safe and alive through this project, so um, that we really thank him for that. And then um, my other colleagues at University of Utah, 
and uh, Louisiana State University who helped out in this project, uh, Bailey Miller, Margot Haygood, uh, Eric Schmidt, and uh, Christine Duong. Okay, so um, to start, wood in the ocean. Um, most people don't really think about wood when they're thinking about marine environments, um, but they probably should because um, tremendous amounts of wood enter the oceans uh, every year. And if you don't believe it, you want to convince yourself, just go to any beach anywhere and look around. Uh, what you'll probably find is the most abundant material on the beach, aside from discarded plastic, uh, is wood. Uh, tremendous amounts of wood enter the ocean uh, each year through coastal erosion, from erosion of riverbanks. Trees fall into the water, branches fall into the water, get carried uh, to the ocean. And once they get there, they can have tremendous impact on marine environments. Um, but what I want to talk about today is kind of another way that wood can enter marine environments and uh, a way that is kind of spectacular. Um, so the story really starts um, about a dozen years ago when uh, fishers off the coast of Alabama and not these guys, these are stock images, but uh, fishermen uh, off the coast of Alabama began to notice that fishing was really great uh, at one particular site. And they were wondering why. And so they hired some divers to go down and take a look and see why fishing was so good in this particular area. Uh, and what they saw was really weird. Uh, at first they saw these large objects sticking out of the sea floor and it looked to them a little bit like coral heads. Of course, there's no coral uh, off of Mobile, Alabama. Uh, so when they got closer, they realized that these were actually tree stumps and they were sitting on the uh, sea floor in life position, exactly as they would look if they had grown right there in place. Um, so that seemed like kind of a mystery. Um, this is a little video I wanna show you just to give you a better idea of what the site looks like. Uh, and the first thing you notice is tons of fish, amazing numbers of fish around this site. Uh, but when you get closer to the bottom, you start to be able to see wood. Like here we see, I don't know if that's working. Yeah, there you can see a log sticking out of the ground. Um, and here there's sort of an eroded bank and out of that bank, oh, what? Yeah, I want you to notice too here, if these kind of holes throughout the wood here, you see lots of organisms have been burrowing in. This is the base of a, uh, a stump that's sticking out of the ground. Um, and then this is this bank where, this, where the bottom is eroding. So the wood is not just on the surface, but it's sticking out of the mud several feet below the surface where this uh, has eroded away. Here's another tree stump that's partially eroded out of the uh, sediment. See all kinds of invertebrates clinging to the wood. Um, and then in, in a moment, you're going to see uh, a tree uh, uh, trunk just sort of sticking out of the mud uh, at the side of this bank here. You see this tree trunk, fish hiding underneath it, things attached to it, and lots of bore holes in it for organisms that are burrowed into the wood. Um, this site is actually fairly large. You only see a little bit of it here, but it actually extends over about 400 feet. Um, so longer than a, a football field. And again, just lots of organisms hanging around, hiding in crevices. Uh, here you can see this tree stump is being used by a fish uh, as, a, as a nest. Okay, so that's not typically what you expect to find eight miles offshore and uh, 20 meters down in the Gulf of Mexico. And you might see that in a, in a lake or where uh, a reservoir has been made and a dam's been erected and, and, and the water level has risen, but you don't expect to see that in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so the question is, how did that wood get there? Uh, and the answer to that question came from one of our colleagues, uh, Christine DeLong, who's a paleoclimatologist uh, at Louisiana State University. Uh, Christine was one of the first scientists to dive on this site. And uh, what she did, among other things, was uh, to collect a lot of wood and to do a lot of core sampling 
And from that, she was able to determine two things. Uh, first, she was able to determine that most of the wood down there is bald cypress, right? So bald cypress is a common tree in the southeastern United States. Uh, it dominates in swampy areas, so it forms these kind of bald cypress swampy forests. And these are common uh, all across uh, uh, southeastern United States. The second thing she found, which was even more amazing, uh, was the age of that wood down there. So through a combination of different dating methods, she determined that the age of that wood was about 60,000 years old. Okay, that's a really old. Um, that puts it back into the late Pleistocene uh, and the Pleistocene, which is otherwise known as the Ice Age, right? So this was not the most recent glacial max. It was about 11,000, 12,000 years ago. Uh, this was the one before. Uh, so at that time, most of North America was covered with a permanent sheet of ice. Uh, and because so much of the globe was uh, covered with glaciers, that resulted in a decrease in sea level. So sea level was much lower during that period. And as a result of that, the, the modern coast, where you see with this white line, um, the, the ancient coast is now many miles out to sea compared to the modern coastline. And there would be where the site we're talking about is. So this site was probably an ancient bald cypress forest that probably existed several miles inland from the coast. But as the ice age ended and sea levels rose, this, this forest became inundated and buried under a layer of sand and peat. Um, and that wood stayed that way, buried under the sediments for some 60,000 years until recently hurricane activity uh, caused scouring of the seafloor and exposed some parts of this forest. So that tells us where the wood came from and why it was there. But what my group uh, was interested in finding out is why does this underwater forest support so much life? Um, and just kind of a spoiler alert, the answer turns out to be uh, not so much what's in, what's on and around the wood as what's in the wood, uh, as you'll see later. Um, so we put together an expedition. We went down to Dauphin Island Sea Lab uh, and used the RV E.O. Wilson. This is probably appropriate for this venue. Um, to go out to the site, again, it's uh, about eight miles off the coast, about 20 meters of water. And then our group uh, collected wood by scuba. And we also deployed uh, settlement panels, which we call baits for short. And these are basically just pieces of rough cut uh, cypress lumber and also some rough cut cypress logs, uh, which we deployed and then collected at later time points. Uh, so after collecting up several hundred pounds of wood, we went back to the Dauphin Island Sea Lab and we had about a week long wood dissection party um, where we spent inordinate amounts of time uh, cutting apart and uh, dissecting these pieces of wood from the ancient seafloor and collecting and tagging and documenting and identifying every single organism that we, we possibly could. Um, so we've collected quite a number of specimens so far in this project, about a thousand specimens to date, uh, representing about 48 species that we could identify and probably many more that we can't. Uh, and these are really diverse. They represent uh, 10 phyla. Um, so we broadly categorize these guys into two categories. Uh, the wood borers, these are the animals that actually burrow into wood and make those holes that I mentioned. Uh, and these fall into two bivalve families. There's the Oladidae. Uh, these are commonly known as pidox. Uh, and they burrow and make very shallow burrows in wood. And they only do it uh, as a form of protection. They can't eat the wood. Uh, and then the other group are the pteridinidae, and they're commonly known as shipworms. Uh, shipworms are able to burrow very deeply into wood, uh, and they can use wood as food. Um, the other broad class of organisms uh, 
were the things that were dependent on the shipworms in their burrows. So these were a variety of organisms that are either preying on the shipworms or scavenging their dead carcasses uh, or uh, just using their, their burrows as habitat. And these include all kinds of things. We have snapper shrimp and ghost shrimp, a variety of different kinds of crabs. Uh, we have annelid worms and flatworms and uh, round worms and gastropod snails, echinoderms, um, all kinds of diversity living inside these burrows inside of the wood. Um, so the next question we wanted to ask was, um, how does this diverse community develop? So who are first ones, who are the pioneers uh, on the wood? And how long does it take to develop these complicated communities? Um, so for that, we looked at our baits. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, it's a piece of uh, bald cypress log. It's just about a foot in length. Um, and you can see this has been exposed at the site for six months. When the divers brought it up, they were pretty disappointed because they looked at it and they said, nothing's happened. It looks just like it was when we put it in. Uh, but as soon as we started to peel the bark off, you began to see a different story. So what you see there where the bark has been removed are the exposed burrows of shipworms. And as you continue to dissect the wood, you begin to realize that this wood has just been demolished from the inside out. So the outside looked completely intact, but inside the shipworms have eaten every little scrap of wood they possibly could. And by this time, six months, they've already eaten all the wood and starved to death and died. So most of what's left in there are small organisms that are scavenging on their dead bodies or are using the wood as habitat. Um, so why is it that wood supports such diverse biomass? Um, you know, if you put any kind of object on the sea floor, it gets encrusted, lots of encrusting organisms attached to it. Things find ways to hide under it or orient to it. Um, and it really doesn't matter what kind of material you put down. Uh, but wood has one property that's distinct from other sorts of things. It contains lots of energy, right? Um, if you put it in a fireplace, it releases lots of energy. Uh, and that energy is mostly tied up in the carbohydrates uh, in wood. So wood is made up of a material called lignocellulose. That's about two thirds carbohydrate or a little more than that. Um, and so it contains cellulose, which is a polymer of glucose. And of course, just about any animal can use glucose as food. Uh, so it can add cellulose, uh, hemicellulose, which is another carbohydrate um, made up of five carbon sugars that most organisms can also use as food. And it's all embedded in a matrix of lignin, which is a phenolic compound. Um, this combination and the way that they're put together results in a material that's incredibly strong, that is largely insoluble, and is very resistant to enzymatic degradation. And as a result of that, it's not a particularly good food. Right? There are very few animals that are able to uh, use wood as food. Um, so at least part of the reason it's difficult for animals to use food, aside from the fact that uh, uh, wood is difficult to chew, um, is that it's, it's pretty complex material. Uh, and there's a lot of different kinds of chemical bonds. And as a result, it requires a lot of different enzymes to be able to break that down into the soluble sugars that animals could use uh, to support their metabolism. Uh, but there are a few animals that can consume wood. And most of us are familiar with termites. They're the most important consumers of wood in the terrestrial world. Uh, and most consumers of lignocellulose be it woody or other kind of leafy plant material, um, consume wood in exactly the same way. They have at least one compartment in their digestive system that is anaerobic and contains thousands of different types of microorganisms. And those microorganisms produce enzymes that help the animals to digest the wood. Um, but shipworms are a little bit different. 
Shipworms are the major consumers of wood in marine environments. And although they're commonly referred to them as worms, they're not really worms. They're actually elongate worm-like bivalves or clams. Uh, so uh, they make their living by burrowing into wood. And as they burrow into the wood, you can see they make these burrows, but they also line them with a calcium carbonate material, a shell-like material that uh, adds to their protection inside the wood. Um, there's lots of different species of shipworms, uh, but you can see um, these are not your average clams. Right? They don't look like any clam you're, you're used to seeing. Um, so with most clams, the entire body is contained within the two shells, right? So the, shell, the shells provide protection for the entire organism. But in the case of shipworms, the shells are really tiny and they're just covering the anterior end of the animal. All of the rest of the body, including most of its internal organs, are actually exposed outside the shell. And, you know, this may seem like an accident or a freak of nature, but in fact, it's a very specific adaptation to life inside wood. Uh, it helps them to be able to bore deeply into wood. So they have little teeth on the, on the shells and they use that shell like a drill bit to bore into the wood. Uh, but as they get deeper and deeper into the wood, they have to maintain contact with the outside right? because they need to be able to bring in water to respire. Uh, so they have this little pair of siphons on their rear end, on the posterior end, uh, one that takes in water and the other that expels water. And so this worm-like shape is actually a specific adaptation. They no longer need the shells for protection uh, because the animals are protected by the wood that they're burrowing in and by this sort of shell-like material that they deposit at the ends of the burrows. So uh, here you can see the, the anterior end of the animal and the, the head of the burrow where it's, uh, this is what we call the excavation face. And at this end is where the siphons stick out. Uh, that's the opening of the burrow. Okay, so how do shipworms eat wood? Um, so it turns out that shipworms eat wood in a very different way than any other organisms that we know of on Earth. Um, so this is a little diagram of a shipworm, uh, and I've taken away most of the organs, so you can just see uh, the digestive system and its gills. Uh, anterior end is here, and the mouth is here. So the animal burrows into wood, it ingests the wood particles, and they go into this large sac called the cecum, uh, and that's where uh, they're digested. So unlike termites, uh, where you find lots of bacteria in the digestive system, in the case of shipworms, there are very few. The digestive system is almost completely devoid of bacteria, um, but they do have bacterial symbionts. They are in the gill rather than in the digestive system. So they're in an organ completely separated from the digestive system and sort of shifted towards the posterior end of the animal. Um, so if you look inside the gill, uh, you'll see these very large sort of amorphous cells inside of each of the gill filaments. Uh, these are called bacteriocytes. And the bacteria are actually living inside these cells, so they're intracellular bacteria. When you look at the inside of these cells, they're just jam full of rod-shaped gram-negative bacteria. Um, also, unlike other marine bivalves or marine organisms that have intracellular symbionts, the symbionts of shipworms are culturable. We've been able to culture uh, several hundred strains of these shipworm symbionts, representing at least two dozen species of closely related bacteria. Um, and the one thing, the one common denominator for all of these is they're all capable of producing a very wide array of enzymes for the breakdown of wood lignocellulose. So we've got symbionts in the gills. We know that when we grow those symbionts in culture, they're able to produce enzymes that can break down wood. The question is, do they produce these enzymes when they're actually growing inside the shipworm? And if they do, are these enzymes somehow transported to the digestive system? Um, so to try to answer that question, we took a, a proteomic approach. And this is work that was done actually a number of years ago already. Um, 
But what we did was we used proteomics to look for proteins that are encoded in the genomes of the symbiotic bacteria. That is, they're made by the symbiotic bacteria. And we look for those proteins both in the gill, and which contains bacteria, and the cecum, which is largely free of symbionts. So first, if we look at the, the proteome of the gill, uh, what we see is that it contains a wide variety of different types of proteins that we could detect. Uh, and these represent a broad array of functional categories, you know, including uh, translation, transcription, ion transport, carbohydrate metabolism, amino acid metabolism, uh, basically everything you would expect to find in a tissue that contained actively growing bacteria. Um, about 12% of the proteins that we detected were actually proteins that were predicted to be involved in lignocellulose degradation. Now, if we look at the cecum, where there are no symbionts, we see a different picture. Um, first, we found that we were actually able to uh, identify and detect symbiont-made proteins that, uh, uh, you know, uh, proteins that were made by the symbionts in the cecum. So that tells us those proteins aren't getting transported from the gill to the gut. But the other thing you'll notice that's different is this is all blue, right? All of, or nearly all of the proteins we detected in the cecum were involved in lignocellulose degradation. So what that told us is not only are proteins making it from the gill to the gut, but they're selectively transported. Only those proteins that are involved in lignocellulose degradation are transported, even though we know that all these other proteins are being made in the gill. Okay, so we now know the bacteria are making these enzymes in the gill. We know they're getting from the gill to the cecum, but the next question is how? And um, that still remains partly a mystery, but recently, uh, just a few months ago, we published a paper that resolves at least part of this story. Uh, so what we found was we made antibodies to the two most common or abundant proteins, symbiont-made proteins uh, that we found in the cecum. And then we used those antibodies uh, to look at sections along the length of the animal. Uh, and what we were looking for was any pathway that we could find by which enzymes could be going from the gill uh, to the digestive system. And amazingly, we, we found something. We found a very minute set of ducts that stretch all the way from the gill to a point very near the mouth of the shipworms. And using those antibodies, we're actually able to show uh, that those ducts inside the lumen of those ducts, we could see, uh, we could detect these cellulolytic proteins made by the symbiotic bacteria. So the, the antibody has a red fluorescent label there. And we were able to trace those ducts all the way back through the midsection of the animal. And again, you see the ducts with the red uh, labeled antibody uh, in them, uh, all the way back to a point near the mouth. So that pretty much told us that uh, these ducts are the likely culprit. They're the likely conduit that's being used uh, to transport these enzymes from the gill to the cecum. And it's a very unusual thing. These, these ducts are actually contained inside of, um, inside of a blood vessel. So um, that's, that's kind of unusual. Blood vessel that stretches all the way from the gill uh, back to the anterior end of the body. Uh, by the way, we didn't actually discover these ducts. Uh, these ducts were actually first described 175 years ago by a guy named Gerard Paul Deshay. So uh, well, we have to give a tip of the hat to that uh, incredible work that he did. Um, but um, uh, what we did was for the first time actually demonstrate what the mechanism, what those ducts are for. Okay, so to summarize this first part of the talk, um, in the uh, AUF or Alabama undersea forest, that's the abbreviation I uh, use for it. It turns out that shipworms play a really important role. Uh, they are the 
primary uh, pioneer species. They're the first ones to enter the wood. Uh, they're the primary ecosystem engineers. They modify the wood and create an environment for other organisms uh, to inhabit. And they form the functional basis of a food chain that would otherwise be unavailable to organisms down there because they're able to digest wood and convert it into their own biomass. And, uh, and by doing that, they make that wood uh, carbon and energy available to other organisms that can prey on them, but can't get energy or carbon from the wood. Um, and so they form the basis of a food chain that attracts lots of small invertebrates and other organisms come to feed on those small invertebrates and larger organisms come to feed on those. And in the end, you get this incredible uh, profusion of life uh, at these sites. Um, so it turns out that uh, although the shipworms are the major uh, consumers of wood at this site, it turns out that there's another way that organisms are getting uh, energy from wood at this site. Um, and that has to do with what happens when wood decomposes in seawater. So when wood rots in seawater, there's a group of bacteria called sulfate reducing bacteria. And they are taking the carbohydrate in wood and they're oxidizing it using sulfate instead of oxygen, All right? So um, what they're doing is converting sulfate that's in seawater, it's a major component of seawater, to hydrogen sulfide, which is a very stinky and very toxic uh, uh, compound. But it's also an energy rich compound that other organisms can use, uh, other bacteria can use as a source of energy. Um, and if you're familiar with the deep sea hydrothermal vents, this is also the compound that is produced in abundance from these deep sea uh, volcanic hot springs. Uh, and if you're familiar, that hydrogen sulfide supports an incredible community of chemoautotrophic animals, right? Animals that have sulfide oxidizing symbionts inside of them. And this includes Riftia pachyptala, which is these giant tube worms you've probably seen before. Also these giant mussels from the mytilid subfamily, Bathymodiolinae, and large vescomide clams and snails. So for example, in the Bathymodiolin mussels, these guys have these sulfide oxidizing bacteria inside their gills. And those bacteria are converting hydrogen sulfide back into sulfate. So exactly the opposite reaction uh, that the sulfate reducers are doing on the rotting wood. And they're using the energy from that to make ATP. And then they use that ATP to fix carbon, to uh, fix CO2 into sugar. And that's done pretty much the same way that uh, green plants do, except the energy source is chemical energy instead of sunlight energy. Uh, and then that sugar ultimately becomes the major source of carbon uh, and energy for the host animal. So because the vents produce so much hydrogen sulfide, uh, these animals are able to grow to some pretty impressive sizes. Um, so about 20 years after the deep sea hydrothermal vents and the incredible communities around them were discovered, uh, another group of mussels was discovered and found to belong to the same subfamily as those giant mussels at the deep sea hydrothermal vents, except these ones are really small. And they're found on sunken wood and sunken organic materials like whale falls or the carcasses of large sharks. Uh, and it turns out, not only the, are they the closest relatives to the bathymodiolin mussels at the vents, uh, but they also have chemoautotrophic symbionts in their gills. And so what they're doing is they're using that hydrogen sulfide that's made by the sulfate reducing bacteria during the decomposition of wood. Uh, and they're using that uh, as their source of energy for growth. Um, so this led to an interesting hypothesis. Uh, and that hypothesis is uh, come to be known as the wooden steps hypothesis. And the idea is 
that it, uh, the thought is that wood, sinking wood, may have acted as an evolutionary stepping stone to help transport wood from shallower water down into deeper water uh, and to transport those tiny wood associated bathymodiolin muscles to the deep sea hydrothermal vents. Of course, once they got there, they found this incredibly rich source of hydrogen sulfide, and that enabled them to evolve over time into uh, the giant mussels that we see there today. But there's one problem with this story, and, and that is that it implies that there is a evolutionary trajectory from shallow water to deep water. And the problem with that is there are no shallow water bathymodial in mussels. I, if you look in OBIS, which is the Ocean uh, Biodiversity Information System, there are over 6,000 records of bathymodial in mussels, but about 99% of them are at depths greater than 100 meters, and the vast majority, 85 or 90 percent, are at depths between 400 and 4,000 meters. So, bathymodiolinate is considered a um, deep sea uh, subfamily, or, you know, strictly deep sea. Uh, that's why we were really kind of shocked when we found this tiny little mussel at the Alabama underwater forest. Um, so, this guy was kind of cute. He's actually about the size of a rice grain. Uh, the curved edge there is it's a petri dish. Uh, and they're able to move around. They're very active. They stick out their foot, attach it to a surface, and drag themselves along. Um, it looked so familiar, but I, I couldn't place it. Um, and in fact, it was a long time before we were able to figure out what they did, because that was the first one that we found. And unfortunately, when we set it aside to be photographed, it wandered out of the bowl and disappeared. So. Now, it, was, it was about another year before we found more of them. But when we did find more of them, we got a chance to look at them closely. We realized that these look like very tiny bathymodial and muscles, very tiny and very fragile. You can see the shells are almost transparent. They're glass-like. Uh, um, so we did some phylogenetic analyses on them uh, using uh, four different genetic loci. That was 18S ribosomal RNA, 28S ribosomal RNA, uh, both encoded in the nucleus, and two mitochondrial genes, uh, cytochrome oxidase 1 and the 16S ribosomal uh, RNA of the mitochondria. And what that, show, oops, what that showed us was that this new muscle is uh, indeed a member of the subfamily bathymodiolinae, uh, but it doesn't quite fit in any of the 10 genera uh, that are recognized for bathymodiolinae. So on the basis of that and uh, some other uh, information, we're proposing a new genus and species for these mussels, uh, Vatumodiolus teridinicola. Uh, and that translates roughly into shallow water mussel that dwells with shipworms. And um, here you can see why. Here's one of these mussels, and it's actually inside a shipworm burrow. In fact, pretty much every specimen that we found was living inside a shipworm burrow in this exact same orientation with the posterior end facing the open end of the burrow. And, and one of the first things you'll notice about this, is this guy's way too big to get out of this burrow, right? The burrow opening is much smaller than the animal. So that means it must have gotten in there as a larval stage or a small juvenile, uh, and then it grew in place inside the burrow. And then of course, once that's happened, here you can see a little better, that's the calcified tip of the burrow. There's one of these animals. He's way too small to get out of that hole. Oh. So once that's happened, he's captive inside of that burrow. That animal has to spend the rest of its life, has to grow and reproduce inside of that burrow, right? And so you might think it was just an accident. <laughs> Right? He wandered into the wrong place. Uh, but we collected oh, probably close to 100 of these uh, on several different, at several different uh, time points uh, uh, and several different collections. And what we began to realize is that they have several features that suggest they may be specifically adapted to living inside of shipworm burrows. So for example, the shells, incredibly fragile. Can't even pick one up without crushing it. He used to use paintbrushes to pick them up. Um, 
that wouldn't do very well for something living outside in the environment. But for something that has the protection of a shipworm burrow, maybe that's okay. Maybe it saves some energy that it doesn't need to spend on making shells. Um, also, the shape is kind of unusual for bathymodial and mussels. They have a kind of conical shape tapering towards the posterior end, whereas most uh, bathymodium and muscles are sort of rhomboid shaped, where they get taller and wider as you go towards the posterior end. So that could possibly be a great shape to have if you need to fit into the conical end of a shipworm burrow. Uh, and here you can see another example of one sitting in the burrow. Uh, and there are its siphons facing towards the opening of the burrow. You also see it has these uh, kind of spikes and hairs sticking out of that. And that may help to keep it away from the burrow edges so that water can pass around it. Uh, another possibility is that they're for protection, maybe they keep predators away. Um, so the last question I want to talk about then is uh, does Batamodes ovus teridinicola have sulfide oxidizing symbionts like uh, virtually all other bathymodial and muscles. All but one so far has been identified that has been identified as symbionts. That's still an open question, but the answer is probably yes. How am I doing for time, by the way? Uh, can anybody tell me? Sorry. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> Okay, uh, so um, yes. So the way we approached this question of whether they had symbionts was uh, through metagenomics, which means that we uh, dissected out the gills, uh, ground them up and sequence all the DNA that's there. That's both the host DNA and the DNA of any bacteria that might be present. Uh, and what we, when we did that, and we used a, a variety of software to pick out bioinformatically the bacterial reads, it appears that all the bacterial reads belong to a single uh, bacterial species, a single genome. Uh, we weren't able to get a complete genome. We were able to get about one megabase of sequence, but very, um, uh, uh, very broken up. So uh, 600 contigs or 600 pieces of sequence. Uh, but we were able to align those sequences with uh, the complete genome of a known bathymodial and symbiont. Uh, this one is from uh, Bathymodialis septim septimviarium. I can't pronounce that one. Uh, uh, but you can see that is a fairly small genome. It's about 1.4 million base pairs. And we were able to recover about 1 million base pairs. And the blue is the uh, whole symbiont genome from bathymodial and muscle. And this one is our putative symbiont. So you can see we get a lot of little pieces, but they align very well. Uh, and then we're able to do something called uh, um, average nucleotide identity comparison. So what that does is it looks at all the coding sequences that you can align and compares how similar they are between the two sequences. We found about 77.5% identity. So that's about the same level of identity you would expect to find for two bacteria that are in the same genus. Okay? And it's similar to the differences we see between other known symbionts of uh, bathymodial and muscles. Uh, we could then also uh, take those contigs and use a tool called the Genome Taxonomy Database Toolkit, which aligns those sequences with about 300,000 known bacterial genome sequences and uh, can generate a phylogenetic tree like this. And nicely what we found is that this new symbiont turns out to be most closely, or this putative symbiont turns out to be most closely related to the symbionts of other bathymodial muscles. Okay, so then just to wrap up, um, Bathymodialis teridinicola turns out to be the first uh, bathymodial in muscle yet described that grows and reproduces in shallow water. Uh, and that's pretty cool by itself. Discovering a new species is always cool, uh, but being able to show that this grows in a different environment than anything else is kind of cool. 
but it also provides support for that uh, wooden steps hypothesis, which, uh, you know, the idea that these bathymodiolin muscles may have been introduced from shallow water into deep water. But it also adds one more twist, which indicates that maybe wooden depths can also extend to shallow, uh, wooden steps can also lead to shallow depths. In other words, wood is also important for the survival of bathymodiolin muscles in shallow water. And it remains to be seen uh, whether we can find other bathymodiolin species in shallow water. Okay. And with that, I'll wrap it up and take some questions. Okay, don't everybody ask it once. Standing by for technical difficulties. Thank you. And your, your experimental blocks of wood are eaten in a matter of months. Yeah. Why is there so much still down? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, so, so the question, question is, is if our experimental blocks get eaten so quickly in just a matter of months, why is it that there's still so much wood at that site? And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is those sites are really dynamic, right? Even when we go back, each time we go back, they look different. Some of the stumps are gone. New stumps have been exposed. Actually, it turns out uh, from Christine's work that there may be at least eight of those sites uh, covering an area of about 10 kilometers uh, out there. And she's also found some as far away as Florida. So it's possible that these kinds of sites ring the entire Gulf Coast. Um, and each time a storm comes through, you can expose some more of this wood. The second uh, part of the answer is that shipworms can only eat so much. They have to have the tube to protect them. Uh, once they've run out of wood, they can't leave the wood. They're stuck in there. Uh, so they just die. Um, and that means the out you saw how the outside of our bait was perfectly intact, but the inside was riddled with holes. Well, the same thing is true with all that wood out there. It's uh, when you break it open, it's just full of holes. And those holes are providing habitat for all kinds of other organisms. So, yeah, that's the two part answer, I guess. Yeah. I just was wondering, I mean, I've seen in the first slide about the group worms, um, individual species of them. So, uh, there's one that has the tubes on their legs. Yeah, that's a super question. Um, so I said super. I hope nobody thought I said stupid. But that, that was a great question. Um, <laughs> uh, so that feathery thing you saw at the end, uh, shipworms have a particular feature that no other bivalve has, and they're called pallets. Um, and what they are are little doors that the animal can use to shove like a cork into uh, the end of the burrow when they want to exclude predators or um, if they're in an intertidal region where they want to prevent water loss, they can stick those, uh, those little doors uh, into the hole and close it off. And they're very diverse across different species, lots of different shapes and structures. And it turns out that that's actually the primary diagnostic feature that people use uh, to identify shipworm. So that feathery one, actually the common name for that is the feathery shipworm. Uh, and it's uh, uh, Bankia cetacea, right? So it belongs to a subfamily called Bankiinae, and all of those have these multiple sort of um, segmented palates, whereas some others have palates that are just one segment. Dr. Distel, I have a couple of online questions. Sure. And we are unmuting my connection to the online audience. So hopefully they'll be able to hear me from here. Uh, and just to let everyone know, we have almost 160 people online somewhere on planet Earth watching this. The first question is, 
the shipworms and the wood. How old are the shipworms and how old is the wood in which they reside? Yeah, great. So, so at this particular site, the shipworms are very young because they don't last very long. Um, in most cases, uh, it depends on the size of the piece of wood. Shipworms have indeterminate growth. So if their piece of wood is big enough and they have no other competitors, they can get up to two meters long. Um, and uh, you know most species are, can get around the, the thickness of your finger. Although we have one species that uh, gets to be about two meters long and it's about you know, three inches in diameter. Um, that's a story for another day. Uh, so typically they run out of wood in just a matter of months and they die. Uh, and they depend on new wood getting exposed. But the wood that they're in at this site is incredibly old. And it's kind of a miracle that that wood is preserved well enough that it can still support shipworm growth, right? You would think that it would be petrified or so otherwise somehow extracted, but it's still very much, you know, looks like modern wood when, when you dig it up and cut it open. Yeah. I'll just do one more online and then we'll come back into the uh, in-person audience. So the uh, putative species V, Terra Dicanicola, has, has it only been found in your Alabama underwater forest, that particular? Yes, so far this is the only site in the world uh, where we've found it. And we actually haven't published this yet, so no one else, you're among the first to find out uh, about these. But we do think that there are other, uh, other similarly sized shallow water bathymodiolin mussels, because there are online databases you can go on and you can search all the museum collections. And in some of the museum collections, we can find bathymodiolin mussels. Uh, there are about 40 records uh, that um, cite a depth that's even shallower than the ones that we've had, but they have not been identified and no one has published on them. So once we publish this, we'll contact them and see if we can find out what those are. Don't tell them. Yes, yeah, we do find other types of wood. And according to Christine DeLong, um, they're all types of wood that are typically found in modern uh, bald cypress forests. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. Um, so they are not obligate wood eaters, but they are obligate wood borers, at least most of them are. Okay, so in fact, among the species that we find uh, at the Hydra, uh, sorry, at the uh, Alabama undersea forest, um, there's one that is very aggressive and it's always the first one to attack fresh wood. Uh, but when we look at older wood, uh, we find another species is the most common one. Uh, so what we think is happening is um, the uh, Banky Gouldi, which is the aggressive one, gets in there, it eats through the wood very quickly and then it dies. Uh, the other species is not as competitive with uh, uh, Banky Gouldi, it's called uh, a nototorado uh, noxi. And uh, that one isn't as, as good at competing for the wood, but once the wood is used up, it's a good filter feeder. So it can actually continue and survive after all the wood uh, is eaten up. So uh, we'll, we find that mostly in the older wood that most of, where most of the wood has been consumed. Um, but in order for shipworms to grow and develop, the larvae have to settle on wood and they have to burrow in wood. We have a few more online and just to our online audience, we'll try and get to as many as we can of the online questions. So if I have two more questions then I'll pass the mic back to Dr. Gordon. Uh, the first question, Dr. Bistel, is if the wood is all eaten, what happens to the life in that little ecosystem? Well, 
what we find is that um, the interior of the wood is consumed, but the skeleton of the wood remains. Uh, and that still lasts for years uh, and it's still used by other organisms uh, for years. And so we find things that are probably specialists at uh, living on wood, but we also find things that are just using it sort of opportunistically. So for example, we find a lot of ghost shrimp in those wetlands. Well, ghost shrimp are typically burrowing shrimp. They, they most often burrow in, in, make burrows in mud, but I guess they find these great sort of shipworm condos there. Um, you know, why not take advantage of them? And the second online question I'll ask you is, can you tell us a little bit more about the Ocean Genome Legacy Center? Wow, I'm, I must have planted that question. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, so Ocean Genome Legacy is uh, an open access uh, genomic resource biorepository, uh, which means that we collect DNA samples and tissue samples from organisms all around, marine organisms all around the planet. Uh, we work collaboratively, so anyone can deposit materials into our collection and anyone can request materials from our collection. Um, the aim of our collection is to support research. So unlike many other collections, although the ideas on this are changing, but uh, you know, many museum collections historically, they try to collect materials and keep them as long as they possibly can, preserve them forever. Um, our idea is that uh, we judge our success by how much of our collection is used. Um, and so we really encourage people to use our collections. Uh, there's no cost to depositing materials to the collection and minimal cost, we have a minimal cost recovery fee uh, to provide samples to other people. But uh, you know, we can provide samples from hydrothermal vents uh, from a $2 million expedition and we can provide them for $31. So <laughs> at nominal cost. Yeah. So anybody wants to find out about Ocean Genome Legacy, by the way, uh, please go to our website, contact us. Our staff is fantastic. They love to talk to you. They will take you seriously, whether you are a student or a professor or, you know, whatever, you, or, or a fisherman, whatever you do. Um, I have a question about the biological series. So, like, analysis, and the fact that the the CBS are cultural areas, like the and I will see nothing about the I will see it's by where the land and the world and the And, you know, I'm actually a proud of the tree called paper on its hormones, right? And they have. Um, and so were you surprised that the sequence was, I think you said it was relatively similar to the Yes. So um, the answer is, yeah, we, we were surprised. Um, but we've looked at an awful lot of species now. Um, and we find the same story. There are some bacteria in some parts of the digestive system, but that cecum, that big sac, is the main area where, um, uh, where wood degradation happens, and we just don't see many bacteria in there at all. Very hard to find any bacteria um, in there. Uh, do we have metagenomic data? Uh, we do not yet have metagenomic data for uh, cecum content but it's definitely on the list to do. So we sort of prioritize places where we knew there were bacteria, but you know, you should never let your preconceived ideas uh, discourage you from doing the experiment. So, yeah. Another great question. So um, there must be, because if you're breaking down wood, you're producing sugar. So this is an environment that is just full of sugar. You would expect bacteria would be there and they would be uh, wanting to consume uh, those sugars. So um, one of the surprising discoveries we found when we started looking at genomes of, 
of shipworm symbionts is they're not just rich in cellulases, they're also rich in secondary metabolites and particularly in um, these biosynthetic gene clusters that produce antibiotics and antimicrobials. And in fact, one of the big selling points of the project that the, the, the fund, uh, the, the grant that supported this project, uh, we have our collaborators in Utah who are looking for uh, antibiotics. And uh, they've already discovered several, uh, one of which is um, actually under, uh, is being examined as an anti, uh, 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 an anti-parasite drug. Uh, there's another one that's just now being examined that uh, is effective against Acinetobacter baumanni, which is a bacterial infection that occurs a lot uh, as a hospital infection. It has a very strong tendency to become uh, antibiotic resistant. And so it's possible that they're producing antibiotics uh, that are also being transported to the digestive system. That's a, actually a project uh, that we're looking at now. 